Great. Okay, so I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our two presenters today. Um, this presentation on solar energy is part of what we originally called our sustainability series. It was the idea of um, offering some informational presentations about topics of interest to us as Eco Village residents related to ecology and sustainability. Uh, Laurie has taken over the coordination of that series, which as you heard is going to now be um, a presentation at least every quarter. And we are going to, I think, stick to the same kinds of topics related to sustainability. So today's presentation is about solar energy, as you've heard, solar power and policy in Pennsylvania, how to build a better energy system at home and at the ballot box. And we actually have two presenters who are going to be with us today. Um, the first is going to be Bill Spahn, and I hope I've said that correctly um, because I don't actually know Bill. But Bill is the owner and president and CEO of a company called True Tech Tools Limited that um, produces tools and test instruments for the trade for trade contractors. Bill and his wife Marilyn have built a net zero home using solar energy and it's located in Indiana Township and he is going to begin by telling us a little bit about his personal experiences in um, in utilizing solar energy. The second presenter then will be Henry McKay. Henry is the Pennsylvania Program Director for Solar United Neighbors in Pennsylvania. It is a group of um, a cooperative group or a group of solar homeowners, basically, who are um, all together um, utilizing solar energy and also wanting to promote policies in Pennsylvania that will support the development of solar and renewable energy. So, um, so without any further ado, I'm going to let um, Bill, um, I think, Stephanie, you'll need to let Bill share his screen, please. I believe everybody can share the screen. Bill, are you able to do that? I'm looking at it now. Uh, can you see a screen of mine? I see your face. Okay. Share screen over here. How about that? That's good. Okay. I'll go back yes, to the beginning. There it is. Perfect. Yep. Great. Yep. Awesome. Okay, you saw everything in reverse. Thanks, Bill. You so. can tell us anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so you probably have more to tell us about you and your journey. So we're, we're really happy to have you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Becky. And thank you, Henry, for coordinating. And thank everyone for staying on board and listening after your meeting. I uh, really appreciate it. So um, like Becky said, we're in Indiana Township. Uh, we're on uh, Church Lane, which is a nice little windy road. Uh, that goes um, from basically Middle Road to uh, Saxonburg Boulevard. If you, you might be familiar with that, it's, there's a lot of horse farms out here and things like that. So our solar journey sort of starts here. Um, we became aware of it when, after we bought the land. Uh, Susan, who in the blue coat there, she uh, was selling us the land. Um, we started talking about what we do as a business and we sell these tools and equipment to contractors all around the country to do better heating and air conditioning work and something called building performance. So how do you tighten up and make a building energy efficient? Uh, and that was in our plan to do for the house. Uh, so I started talking with Susan about it because she was interested in what are you going to do with this land that I'm selling you? And then she said, well, hey, maybe other people in this area would be interested. Now, we also have uh, the situation where the Duquesne Light Company was or still is planning to build a power transmission line that cuts through an agricultural zone or actually two agricultural zones in this area. And Susan sort of had mounted, um, I would say like a community objection to this uh, called respect the ag zone. So she was very involved with a lot of people in the community. Uh, and actually the, the power lines would have run over the edge of our property. So if we were very interested too, uh, that we didn't want to have this big tower and these uh, high voltage lines running out there. So she said other people should be interested in responsible energy. So we ran what we call an open house. We pulled together a few people and I think around 30 or 40 people came. One of them was Henry McKay, my co-presenter today, or I'm his co-presenter, but Henry standing there at the smile and solar panel in his hand in that picture, that's where I met Henry and became aware of the Allegheny County Co-op for Solar United Neighbors, Sun PA. Um, so after that, we were, we were, thinking about building a passive house. And I know the, the eco village is planned to be passive house um, 
type uh, buildings. Uh, and I, I think that's a lot easier when you have sort of uh, joined spaces together than it is for single family buildings. It's a little bit hard because you have so much exposed surface area. I'm an engineer, so I'll try not to drift off into too much engineering words here. But we were thinking about doing it. We contracted with an architect to do passive house and passive would indeed uh, require at least some on-site generation of, of energy, uh, some kind of renewable and solar sort of moved into the forefront there. So we the, that was a point, sort of the turning point in early 18, we were thinking like solar, this is definitely in our picture. Um, as we moved along to, to take care of the land, we noticed it was very sunny here. <laughs> so we, actually my wife, Marilyn, named it Sunnyfield. Uh, we would drive around the tractor mowing the lawn and realize we had a beautiful Southern exposure, really ideal for passive. Uh, we decided in June of 18 to build a modular home, uh, which is very interesting. It's a high performance modular home. It's almost passive. Um, well, we, we actually, we dropped sort of the concept of full passive house um, because it really didn't work out too well at the factory and began, began kind of to be expensive for a house that we were, we were building here. Uh, and we dropped back into, uh, uh, I'd say an almost passive house, many of the same parameters, triple pane windows, very airtight thermal brakes, uh, external ventilation, all those kind of things are built in, but not every single level of passive. Uh, and then in October, we had this township energy event, uh, which were, where the, p the picture came from, the photo came from there. And that's sort of how we sort of moved into this process of becoming aware of solar, how it integrated with our house plan and aware of Solar United Neighbors. Since then, Henry's actually invited me to be on the board of advisors for Solar United Neighbors of PA. So um, that's one of the reasons I'm doing this, but it keeps me connected. And, and, and I find out things in my world that I share with Henry, and he certainly in the organization shares things back with me. So I think it's a great, a great relationship. This was the land uh, in November 2018, if you can recall back to that timeline. Uh, this was before anything was developed there. Shortly after we purchased it, had uh, decided that we were going to build on it. Uh, so basically, it was a big, open, sunny field. Um, that's a little cut out I did just to kind of get an idea what the house would look like. That was my 3D model by holding a piece of paper up in front of the land. Um, so this is January of 2020. Uh, the foundation was set. The foundation was actually built in a factory. The four modules weighing tons were actually built in a factory in October and were set in place by crane stacked, four boxes stacked in January of 2020. Uh, the, the, it was an excellent builder excellent factory, everything lined up, unbelievably lined up so well. I mean, gaps of like three eighths of an inch over 64 feet. That was all the gaps that were there that had to be filled and kind of retrofit on site. So we were able to get a really high quality construction with the modules being built in a factory, all the materials under cover, et cetera. This is what it looked like. Um, a little bit uh, less than a year ago in June of 2020, you can see now that the solar panels are installed. We use ground, a ground mount array, 32 panels, about 12 kilowatts, 12, 12 kilowatts DC. Uh, and you can see the house to the right is already majorly finished. Uh, we didn't end up moving in until November 2020, but it was pretty well finished by June, the kind of the exterior facets and features. This is what it looked like in Christmas after we had moved in. Um, it's around 2,800 square feet on two floors, plus a full height, 1,600 square foot basement. Um, and the cost to build, it's in the middle range for, for a custom build. Some people ask me that question. Uh, we also heat and cool this with a two ton air source heat pump. Uh, no extra electric heating or anything, resistance heating, anything like that. Uh, we actually did have a problem, but we've been able to, even in those two degree days we had, uh, within the last month or so, the last six weeks, uh, we were able to be perfectly comfortably warm inside with a very small heating system that was electric only uh, because we had designed the structure of the house and the air tightness so well. And we, we chose solar for our home because it's all electric. And that, that was one of the plans, which I was influenced by a couple of people that I work with, uh, network with in the industry across the country. And it really spoke to us uh, together, Meryl and I, that it's the way of the future. Um, sometimes I say like this house was built with ideas stolen from the future. Makes it a little bit uh, exciting there that we stole ideas that we got in our time machine. But we have a heat pump 
to do the heating and cooling. Uh, if you're not familiar with heat pumps, I could go on and on about those, but I won't right now, uh, unless there's a question. Uh, we have an induction cooktop. There are no, there's no combustion in the house on the property, except for our car and our tractor at this point and our grill outside. Everything that does combustion is outside. One of my um, other facets is I do uh, expert witness work in carbon monoxide poisoning. So I know a fair amount about combustion. I do a lot of combustion training. We also have a heat pump water heater. You can see that sort of in the center here of the picture. This is the induction cooktop. Uh, heat pump clothes dryer over here on the right. So there's nothing connected to the outside. It takes the inside air, runs it through, dries the clothes, and then recycles it and takes the water out of the air. Uh, it actually has a drain on it and it pumps the condensation, the moisture from the clothes down the drain, just like the, the washer does. Um, we wanted to get, this wasn't all about building a, you know, a house without sort of style or comfort or taste. We decided to get an electric fireplace uh, so that we had that kind of warmth and ambiance. Uh, we also have a heated floor in the master bathroom. Uh, that's something that some people might say, oh, you know, how could you do that? That's wasting energy. Well, the, this is our forever home. Uh, we wanted it to be comfortable and we felt like we weren't splurging on that feature. We were getting a feature that we wanted and we understood sort of the trade-off there in energy. And it isn't that bad because you can set it on a timer. Um, you can very easily turn it off. Uh, we also plan to get a battery electric vehicle in the future. So that again, lends towards electric and then goes back towards getting our power from a renewable source and that would be solar. And then even if we do consume more than we generate with the solar and we can't afford more solar panels, electric power production is getting cleaner as time goes on. Fossil fuel production is not getting any cleaner because it always has to produce uh, an emission. So in the low, lower right here is a picture of the air source heat pump, that little unit there is what handles all the heating and cooling for the whole house for four zones for basically 4,400 square feet. Um, if anyone's familiar with or interested in that, that ratio of 2,200 square foot per ton of heating and cooling is way out there, way out there in the curve um, in terms of being um, pr pretty high ratio. Uh, usually it's around 750, something like that, or 500. So how did things go with all these plans? Um, you know, being an engineer, I'm a planner. Uh, not everything went according to plan, uh, but a lot of things did. Uh, we joined the co-op that was actually very easy. Uh, we signed a contract with Invinity, who was the provider and sort of the awardee of the co-op uh, solar uh, installation contracts uh, for that period of time. Uh, in late 2019, they did some planning, siting, ordering materials. March 20th, or March of 2020, it went in basically within three days. Uh, that's a picture in the upper right corner there, the construction, very careful, very meticulous work. Uh, we weren't living on, on site at the time, but I kept driving over because I was just so thrilled to see this go into place. On July 20th, I did a little video. It's the solar switch on video. Uh, I actually have a website for my house called sponehome.com, S-P-O-H-N-H-O-M-E.com. You can see the video there of the, the solar switch on, which I want to say it was Bastille Day for whatever reason sticks in my mind, like July 14th, uh, 2020. So that's when we were allowed by the utility after all the permitting and inspection and installation to actually flip that switch, which then allowed us to use the power being produced by the solar array in the house. Then in, we had to also, right after switch on, then we could apply for these solar renewable energy credits with the state and actually get an operating permit. And I want to say it, it I've seen some uh, different documents that we actually are listed as a power plant in the state, a, a registered power plant uh, at a low, very, very low operation level, but we actually have to be registered with the state in order to get these solar renewable energy credits and all the paperwork to work. Uh, November 20th or November 16th, 2020, we moved in. And then uh, in December, I started to notice that our electrical consumption was high, about two to three times higher than I had planned. And that was due to a faulty installation of the heat pump. So I don't want people to walk away thinking heat pumps are bad or hard to install. This one wasn't installed correctly. Once we got it fixed in early February, things have been fantastic. That's when actually the colder uh, season, the colder uh, days set in 
and we've switched off any kind of electrical resistance backup heat, and we've been running fine with just the um, just the, the the heat pump heat. This is a little bit techy, but this is something that Infinity does. It's a power production report. So they actually get really intricate detail. And I did a little zoom out of the monthly production that's expected on this site right here, uh, based upon historical information. And this is the kind of production that would be expected. Uh, and this uh, 1000 would be a megawatt, so 1000 kilowatts. Uh, and we've, we've actually been running a little bit higher than this. In fact, I submitted for my solar renewable energy credits a couple months ago, and they denied them because I said I produced too much, because I fell outside of their expectation um, based upon history. And we had some rather sunny days in November, and it was actually sunnier in November than it was in October, uh, at least on this site here. So we produced more. And so now, I've, I, now I know to uh, underreport a little, and they can always roll over the credits. Um, the intricacies of solar are that not, it's not perfect. You don't get 100% of the energy out. There's various things that can affect it, the inverters, the wiring, uh, mismatch of loads, reflection, shading, soiling. But this is all custom tailored to our site so that we know kind of coming into it how much power we can expect coming out. So the annual production expected is just uh, almost well 16.7 megawatt hours. And me being an engineer, I'm watching these numbers. I want to see how it performs, how it works. I want to learn more about this. So I watch the production every day. I can get it added in an app from the solar inverters. Um, I had to put these two, the scales are, are uh, I tried to align the scales here to show you the difference. Some days recently, this is, this was uh, what, a week ago, 82 kilowatt hours for the day. But then uh, that's yesterday is 22, 0.14 kilowatt hours. So it really varies. Um, this would basically be a cloudy, not so sunny day. This would be a full blue sky day where the inverters actually peak out and they produce the maximum power, just a little a shade over 10 kilowatt hours uh, for, for that time period. So this was actually the highest day I've ever seen. And I've been watching since September. So uh, this, this bodes well for the summer and for production here, and I'll be watching it more as we go on. Um, we do have net metering with the utility, of course, that's what we applied for, and that's what allowed us to switch it on. I also have a, like a $150 electrical monitor set up to monitor all the circuits in my house, because I wanna know if something's consuming too much or too little, and maybe there's something I need to adjust. So I'm still in the mode of adjusting things uh, to sort of tune it into our comfort level and the way we desire to use the energy. Um, this, and the inverter, one of the inverters faulted out on February 3rd uh, and started and reduced the re production by half. And luckily I was watching the output every day. I saw it, called the installer. They came in a few days later and got us back up to full production. So we lost half of the power production um, we were still producing power, but only half as much because one of the inverter uh, did not work. And, and sort of the last statement here I want to make is, um, well, the solar does work in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh. Um, you can see there are bright days and there are cloudy days. And when you overproduce like this and you net meter, it goes back to the utility. And this is a picture from, uh, I believe it's uh, September timeframe before we moved in. And all these green bars below are negative kilowatt hours, negative consumption. So these are the days where we were pumping energy back onto the grid and the grid holds it as a bank, sort of as a virtual battery. Then when you need it, uh, when it's cloudy, when it's rainy, nighttime, uh, it will then pull it back out of that bank. It'll pull a kilowatt hour you know, credited with a kilowatt hour used until you get to every May, if you have money kilowatts left in your bank, they'll send you a check at the cost of production which is seven cents a kilowatt hour. I think it's a very fair system. Um, here's a little bit about the uh, our cost and net metering SREX. I showed you some of the net metering uh, details. Uh, it's $32,000 complete, 32 panels. So it was about $1,000, but that included all the wiring, all the installation, all the electrical boxes, uh, the trenching, uh, the construction. Uh, so that that's what we encountered uh, for this, uh, for our cost. Uh, we did. We are applying for. We've submitted for the 26% federal tax credit. Um, 
And Henry's going to talk a little bit more about the SREX, the Solar Renewable Energy Credits, but this is a picture of my dashboard. Um, I signed up and SREC Trade is a third party that keeps a little bit of the transaction, 7%, I believe, and then returns the rest to me, but they track everything, they compile, verify, and then trade the credit at the optimal price. So I put in my... Uh, I have, I have one meter called a power production meter that I look at the first of every month. I enter the data and then it subtracts the difference between the last reading and the first reading and then rounds it down to the nearest full megawatt hour. The rest of those megawatt hours are kept in the bank. They could be added to and used in subsequent months. But every time you go over an integer number, that creates one SREC and then that SREC can be traded. Uh, and that, so that's right now with the, the value of the SREX in Pennsylvania, and that's probably what we're going to talk about. It's a few hundred dollars a year. It's running between $18 and $20 per SREC. Um, so we have a, uh, with everything included and just a real rough projection, because we haven't lived here a year, we haven't produced solar for a year, not everything was working for a year, uh, but I've done a crude estimate now saying 10.1 years for payback for the system, but I'll be watching it once we get everything tuned up to do a real hard number on that. And as I mentioned, uh, the net metering first, the energy is banked with the utility and you can draw it kilowatt hour per kilowatt hour, or then paid back if your bank has a net balance in it uh, every May, uh, they would pay back at seven cents a kilowatt hour. Um, sorry for the fuzzy graph here, but this was to give an idea of how things went in terms of excess generation uh, in gray versus orange consumed energy. And then power that we had to purchase, like we, there was more consumed here than there was available from the solar. Uh, and this was part, part of this was due to that, uh, the heat pump issue that I mentioned, but you can see back here, the, um, the generation was quite a bit higher than what was consumed. Uh, and then as we started, it was basically we moved in in November, uh, we had a lot of credits built up in the bank and we consumed all those credits again, because we had that sort of faulty system that was, that was uh, consuming too much energy. So uh, maintenance, just wanted to cover that. Uh, basically, they recommend gentle cleaning, kind of hosing down for any soiling on it. Um, I did try some snow removal. It was kind of funny. I tried it two or three times. I could only reach, as you can see, I could only reach with a snow brush halfway up the array. Uh, I spent about 45 minutes walking back and forth, gently brushing snow off of them. Uh, came out a few hours later and everything was cleared, the top and the bottom row. So the top row untouched, the bottom row that I cleared was clear, but uh, basically if there's any kind of sunlight at all, uh, the blackish area is going to absorb thermal energy and sort of melt the snow and it'll roll off the top of it. So um, when I told some friends, they said, oh, you got some nice exercise out on a bright, uh, cold winter day uh, by removing snow. Didn't need to do it. So that's my, um, th those are my uh, thoughts and experiences here. I want to give a quick overview from some, from some different perspectives. Be happy to answer any questions or we can move on to Henry, whichever you want to do. Um, let me ask Henry. Henry, how are you feeling? Because we were a little late starting. If you have a hard stop at three, shall we do questions now for Bill or shall we wait till the end? Uh, yeah, maybe we, I could just get, get going and then we'll do all the questions when I'm finished. No, I'll, I'll try to go as, as quickly as I can. Okay, so I would encourage people to either write your questions down or put them in the chat for Bill. And I have put the website for Bill Spohn's um, home, the Spohn Home website into the chat. So if anybody's interested in learning more, um, you can check out that website. So now Henry, again, is the Pennsylvania Program Director from Solar United Neighbors Pennsylvania. He's got a presentation for us as well. And I'm going to put the Solar United Neighbors PA uh, website also in the chat. Thanks for being here, Henry. Welcome. Thank you, Becky. And, and hello, everyone. Thanks for, for giving us some time to, to talk to you about solar energy. So um, uh, as Becky said, my name is Henry McKay. I'm the Pennsylvania Program Director of Solar United Neighbors. Um, I live here in Pittsburgh, not far from you all. And um, we are a, a national nonprofit network of, of rooftop solar supporters. Uh, our role is to help people go solar, people like Bill, who we hope to go solar, join together and fight for their energy rights. So we offer both practical guidance for people to um, actually go through the process of going solar. And then we do advocacy and grassroots organizing to help people um, 
create policy change to make it easier for more people to benefit from solar energy. And we, we like solar not just for its environmental benefits, but we are particularly excited about rooftop solar, distributed solar, even though it's not always necessarily on a rooftop like in Bill's case, because not only does it have these environmental benefits, but it also, it contributes to this energy system that shares economic benefits more widely. You're not concentrating power generation, you know, just in a few power plants owned by a few large companies. You're having everybody able to own a power plant and earn a financial return from that in addition to helping, you know, promote clean air and water and fighting climate change. Now I'm going to be talking about um, one of the most important solar or really alter generally alternative energy policies in Pennsylvania. And it's called our Alternative Energy Portfolio Standard, the AEPS. And it has a direct effect on the economics of going solar at the household level. Now, the AEPS was a law passed, I think it was 2004. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a fairly extensive uh, piece of legislation, but the core of it is, is this kernel right here. Electric utilities must get 18% of their energy from alternative sources by 2021. Uh, they break down that alternative sources into 10% actual renewables and 8% other alternative sources, things like waste coal, uh, like landfill methane, um, you know, because this is Pennsylvania and it can't just be all renewable stuff. Um, and then the target year is actually May 2021. That's uh, when they have to hit, the utilities have to hit this target. Half a percent within this um, must come specifically from solar energy. Solar is the only energy source that gets its own special carve out. So it's called the solar carve out. The way, um, so people like Bill who have solar, you know, whether you're a homeowner who has solar, whether you are a company who's built a huge solar farm um, that covers many acres, Every time you generate a thousand kilowatt hours of energy, you earn one of those SRECs, the Solar Renewable Energy Credit, SREC. Utilities are buying these credits to meet their targets from the AEPS. Because we have a deregulated energy system in Pennsylvania, we've separated. So Duquesne Light is just a distribution utility. They don't own any power generation. They just manage the wires that carry power from somewhere else to our homes and businesses. Um, the way they meet those AEPS targets, rather than building their own solar, solar farms, because they can't do that, they, they're purchasing SRECs from people who already have solar. So the SREC seller gets some money, which helps lower the net cost of their, of their solar investment as part of the return of their solar investment, in addition to, of course, the, the lower electric bills they, they, they enjoy. Um, and then the purchaser of the SRECs, the utility, gets to count that, that's one megawatt hour towards my compliance requirements. And these SREC, SRECs are traded on a market, so the price is affected by supply and demand. Um, and basically that means that the higher the solar carve out is, that means there's more demand from utilities to buy SRECs. More demand means those SREC values are higher, the price goes up. Higher SREC values mean, mean more people can afford to go solar and it means more solar is actually installed. So you have a pretty direct effect. You set a higher solar carve out, you get more solar in Pennsylvania. Now, our alternative energy portfolio standard, you know, the numbers are fairly low, especially that solar carve out half a percent. Um, and the result of that is we don't have a lot of solar in Pennsylvania compared to many other states in the Eastern US. And you can see this bar graph on the right, you know, at least in this region, we're towards the bottom of the pack. Um, and this isn't because of, you know, anything to do with weather or because we're in a particularly cloudy area. You can see there's other, you know, northeastern states, Connecticut, you know, Maryland, New York, Massachusetts, who have similar climates to us. We can't blame this on the weather. We can really only blame it on policy. And most of our neighbors, basically everyone except Ohio and West Virginia, have much more aggressive portfolio standard laws. Um, they have high targets for solar energy and renewable energy, and that results in more, more of those renewable energy sources being built in those states. So we are really falling behind our neighbors on this, on this particular measure. 
And a function of, of those low solar energy goals is low SREC values. So our, our SRECs in Pennsylvania are somewhere around 23 bucks. Solar energy. Um, and uh, you know, Maryland, New Jersey, and DC have higher goals. They have higher SREC values. You can see that Washington, DC SREC price, that's the, I th believe it's still the highest in the country. And that's because they have a very aggressive renewable energy goal. And what that means is where in Pennsylvania, a residential solar system might pay for itself in around eight to 12 years. In DC, it's more like two to four years. And that is um, at least partly, partly because they have higher energy prices in general, but also because of these really high SREC values that accelerate the return on investment. And I think you know the benefits of more solar sh should be obvious, but just to put a fine point on it, it, it means more homeowners, more schools, churches, businesses are saving money with rooftop solar. It means we have cleaner air and water, lower carbon emissions. Um, solar has particular benefits in a place like Pennsylvania where we have an especially dirty grid because of all the coal that is still burned to create energy. So when you're replacing Pennsylvania grid energy, it has a lot more benefits than it might in, in another state that doesn't burn as much coal as we do. Um, for large scale solar, which is, is often built in rural areas, sometimes on leased farmland, those farmers who are hosting that large scale solar can earn 800 to 1000 bucks an acre per year for 25 years, which essentially they're diversifying their por portfolio. They're growing you know, corn, soybeans, and solar energy. And, um, it can help keep farms in business, and especially dairy farms who, you know, really need a, a more reliable uh, source of source of income. We've seen so many dairy farms close recently in Pennsylvania. This can be a lifeline. And then of course, it means more green jobs, and it means those jobs are coming to Pennsylvania, not all going to our, our neighbors with their more ambitious solar solar targets. So I mentioned May 2021. This May is when we hit the the tart we're supposed to hit the target every year up until now since 20 2004 that target has been slowly ratcheting up and approaching half a percent solar um but once we hit may it's going to stay at half a percent and it's not going to rise and so utilities aren't going to be, be buying more and more srx every year they'll just be buying the same amount and maintaining that half a percent and that means that if we don't um you know, our net other SREC values are not going to rise, but they're probably going to fall, and it's going to be a further disincentive for installing solar in Pennsylvania. And this, of course, is an uphill battle in, in a state like ours. Um, you know, doing any kind of renewable energy legislation is always difficult, but it's not so much because solar is unpopular in, in Pennsylvania, it's because solar is unpopular in the General Assembly. Um, Broadly speaking, solar is extremely popular in Pennsylvania, where you're talking, whether you're talking about rural populations or urban populations, Democrats or Republicans. So this is a survey from 2019, and they were asking people which of the following options holds the greatest promise for addressing our energy demands in the next five years. And you can see the clear winner is investing in renewable sources like solar and wind. And that was equally true for, for rural respondents, the blue bar, and urban respondents, the red bar. What we're trying to do is to make sure that people in, in Harrisburg understand this broad support that solar has, and it's something that is widely popular. Now, there is a bipartisan bill coming. It actually, it might have just been introduced. Uh, we were expecting it to, to show up on Friday. Um, I, I haven't checked since to see if it is there, but we know that um, a Democrat, State Senator Art Haywood from Philadelphia, and a Republican, State Senator Dan Laughlin from Erie, are introducing a, or they're both sponsoring this bill that would require 5.5% of our energy to come from solar by 2026. So that's up from 0.5%. It's an 11 fold increase. Um, it is ambitious, but still very within the realm of achievable. And it is, it is bipartisan. So there is, you know, this is something that's not going to just sit in committee and, and die necessarily. As, as long as we you know, make our voices heard. So this is one of the things that we do at Solar United Neighbors is we try to mobilize solar supporters to get them to talk to their legislators about these issues. Um, we have an action alert. I can, I can stick it in the chat here. Um, so if you visit that link in the chat, it'll you'll fill out a form and it'll essentially help you send an email to your state senator 
asking them to support this legislation from Haywood and Laughlin. Um, and we also, you know, we want to mobilize people to take even more aggressive action than that. Um, so we have, we're, we're a membership organization and what, one of the things we help our members do, if you join as a member, is it is free to do that. We can help you schedule in, you know, a, a Zoom meeting with your legislator to talk to them directly about these issues, writing letters to the editors, rallying support within your community, um, you know, taking, taking the next step to, to talk to our, our legislation about solar energy. Because, you know, we're seeing changes at the federal level with how the government is approaching issues like climate change. It's of course a different story at the state level, but some of the most important legislation policy related to things like solar energy happens at the state level. This is still really where the action is in terms of actually getting renewable energy installed. And you know, at the state level, of course, you can be much more influential because you're, um, you know, you're much closer to your elected official than you are to someone like Pat Toomey or Bob Casey. And that's all I have. Um, I, my email address is down there, PA team at solarunitedneighbors.org if anyone wants to get in touch. But um, Bill and I are happy to stick around for a while and answer any questions you have about what we've been talking about. Thank you very much, Henry and Bill. I think that was really informative. So now we do have a few minutes for questions, I believe. So I don't see any in the chat right now. If you have a question, maybe raise your hand and I can call on you, Marsha. Um, I'm not sure the process to go through. I just did the introductory meeting, but I'm wondering about the next sociocracy class. How, how does that work? Can we, um, can we email Marsha, Stephanie maybe? Or have you, or put Dem's email, yeah. I'll get back to you, Marsha, um, and, and talk about that. Okay, thanks. Any questions related to Bill's presentation? How about Doug or, or um, Henry's? Doug. Um, my question is what, what in their estimation would be the ultimate potential for solar in this region? So um, what kind of percentage do you think could be generated from solar? So it's hard to say what the upper limit would be, you know, because the technology just, just keeps getting more efficient and affordable. Um, there was a study that the, that the Department of Environmental Protection um, put out a couple of years ago called Finding Pennsylvania's Solar Future. And they were looking at, uh, they determined that we could get to, we could pretty achievably get to 10% of our energy coming from solar um, within roughly a decade. So that'd be a huge increase over what we have now. They were also you know, seeing that if we used all of our abandoned mine lands for solar, we could get far higher than 10%. And then of course, if we're talking about rooftops and parking lots and other already built space, that e adds even more. So, um, you know, as you put more and more renewables on the grid that are intermittent, like solar energy, of course, there, you have to think about things like storage and making sure power is generated when it's needed. But we have a lot of low hanging fruit to pick um, in terms of adding solar to the grid so far. I have another perspective on that, if I could. 40% uh, of energy is consumed by buildings. A lot of it's housing. And I would say before you invest in solar, you should invest in permanent investments in megawatts, negative watts as in energy reduction. Then you can have a, you can install a renewable system, perhaps solar that's smaller. You can have smaller heating and air conditioning systems, everything downscales and things become more, more affordable. So I think in addition to just generating more and thinking about that, you have to think about consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, so that goes back to this responsible use of energy thing that where I met Henry at, uh, you know, because a, a better, a, a more efficiently consuming house is also more comfortable and healthy and as well as being energy efficient and then allows for solar because we, we actually have a neighbor who has a very leaky house, has a lot of systems on his house. He put in four times as much solar as I did. He might've needed twice as much if he had instead put the money towards making the house more efficient. Mm -hmm. 
and and the eco village is building efficient houses so yay hooray yeah, yeah we are yeah um marcia i have a bill a uh, question for henry or bill i don't know who wants to answer it but i put 22 solar panels on my house uh roof a couple years ago and i um i had green mountain energy as my company but they couldn't give me the srex so i had to switch back to duquesne and i'm wondering is that still the case so it was probably that they wouldn't net meter. Right. So they wouldn't let your excess solar production reduce the part of the bill they were providing. Right. Um, your generation transmission part of the bill. And yeah, so so we have great net metering in Pennsylvania where you can offset your bill with your extra generation. You overproduce it in the summer, you build up credits, and you can spend those credits down in the winter. Um, but it's only if you're on default power. So it's only if you haven't shopped around and choose an alternative provider. Some of the alternative providers do offer net metering. If anyone's ever used PA Power Switch, that website to let you shop for energy, one of the search filters, you can check a box that says allows net metering. Although I, I'm always a little skeptical of those because it's, you know, they might be using that term a little differently. Um, you'd really need to read that contract to make sure you know how they're net metering. But if, my recommendation, if you want to be sure you're getting your full bill net metered, would be to stay on default power. That was true for us. Duquesne Light said, only on default power will you be able to net meter. Only us. Mm -hmm. And they're not all green energy, right? No. They're a mix. Thanks. Jim, I see your hand up. Yeah. Now, we're, you understand the situation that we would have where we're going to be using very little energy. Is there an advantage for us to put a lot of solar panels in primarily just to sell back. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, with this net metering, I'm not sure whether we have an advantage to put a lot of solar panels in. Well, I think the, the advantage you have is you won't, because the house will be so energy efficient, you won't need very much solar to basically cover your whole bill, cover your, your whole years of, of energy usage. Now, if you wanted to build extra solar and overproduce with the intent of selling it back, you could, you, uh, a residential system in Pennsylvania can get as large as 50 kilowatts, which is humongous. Um, but the way our net metering works now is your, if you have extra energy at the end of each month, it rolls over to the next month. But at the end of the billing year, which is in May, if you have any energy left over, they don't roll it over the next month at the full rate, they'll send you a check for that extra energy at a reduced price, at the, the price to compare, so the generation and transmission part of your bill. So like if, if you need seven kilowatts of solar and you built 10, it's gonna be easier to pay off that first seven rather than that last three, because that last three, that extra energy is being credited at a lower rate. Okay. I think Lori's had her hand up for a while. Lori, I'm sorry, I must have missed it. It's a quiet hand. Um, <laughs> I like see it. There it is. Okay. I want to thank you both for the presentation. One question I have I saw a video about a week ago, and it kind of frustrated me because it, um, it was from an engineer, and, uh, and I checked him out. He's legitimate and all the rest. He went to the university I went to. It was talking about and I'm wondering if you have any information on this, the, be the beginning to end cost, because they were saying like some of the rare metals and that used to produce solar panels and other things and mining it out of the ground and all that to cost. Actually, if you do comparison beginning to end, he was saying, he didn't say anything about the carbon footprint, but it was sort of indicating that, well, using fossil fuels is still better. He didn't come out right and say it. So I think is there an agenda there or something? Maybe not, but I'm yes. just curious if that type of cost analysis have been done. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I look at these things closely too and with a, a skeptical eye and they're, they're being, um, th that's a manipulation of information. Yeah. Uh, there, there are tremendous hidden costs and impact from fossil fuels. Uh, there's a recent study that came out, I think just a couple of days ago, uh, that shows that the hidden cost of fossil fuels are much higher than anyone's ever estimated before. Um, and that you're going to hear things like that. That's all. Yeah. yeah and on the note, I, I did some research. He went to the university. I did. He's with a legitimate organization, but everybody 
I know statistics can be manipulated quite easily if you yeah. don't know how to read them. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, there's there's some people who you, you will only hear them start to be concerned about toxic waste and recycling when they're talking about solar. Mm -hmm. um, we yeah. were just hearing from a legislator in Ohio who was saying, you know, I don't want this uh, proposed solar farm in my district because I heard solar panels ca catch on fire and they release toxic metals in, into the air. And it's almost like he was talking about coal because <laughs> yeah. setting things on fire is pretty central to how coal works. Yeah. And um, it releases lead and all these other heavy metals into the air. Now there's, with solar, there there's a type of, so like the kind of solar that Bill has, um, there's, there's no kind of, it's basically silicon, aluminum, glass, copper wiring, and then if they're using lead in the solder for the electrical connections, there will be small amounts of lead in there, but it stays in the panel. And then when they dispose of the panel, it stays with it. Um, of course, with, when you're burning coal, you're putting the lead into the air. Um, and uh, with there's, there's a kind of solar panel called thin film, which is a low efficiency panel. It's sometimes used at very large scales, like big solar farms. It, it's, it's still kind of a niche technology. It, operate, it occupies a pretty small minority of the total solar that's out there. That does have heavy metals like cadmium and, and telluride um, that you know have issues with how they're mined and issues with how they're, they're disposed of. Um, but you can avoid that by just using the kind of traditional crystalline solar panels like the, that, that Bill has. So sometimes those, are, those two are conflated when people talk about heavy metals and they don't know that there's two different kinds and they, they confuse themselves. Thank you. Other questions, anybody? Uh, Stephanie. Yeah, I, I'm interested, um, both uh, Henry and, and Bill, and thank you so much for this really um, enlightening presentation. W we've had solar panels on our roof and, and the house we own next door um, for about eight years now, and it's fabulous to, <laughs> to see um, that our bill went from like $120 a month and, and we converted everything, dryer, water heater, everything to electric except for our boiler. And um, now it's 10, 10 or $13. So it's, it's really wonderful. But my question is, what are you seeing in the evolution of solar technologies? Um, it was interesting to hear about thin film. I've heard about that, uh, but from the perspective of the um, the toxicity, that's interesting. Um, what else is evolving um, out there in, in terms of capturing solar energy for for our use? Um, I'll speak first. I have a couple things. Um, the, the watts per panel is going up. Um, the, the technology to build them. So they're becoming more efficient per square panel area. And then there's a technology called bifacial, uh, where it actually captures some reflected light from the backside of the panel. And in certain installations, that can be very beneficial to grab a few more photons to generate more electricity. Um, and and I think there, there's a lot of things like um, you'll, you'll read about there are technologies that are so far down the road in speculation. You need to look at what could someone, I mean, if you're really interested in it, what could someone install for me in the next year? That's where your focus needs to be because that's the only place that your money will have impact. You know, if, you know, if, if you're looking at doing something in the next year or so, uh, you can't wait for a, a better technology, like a 500 watt per panel, mine are 375. I think they're now 405. I, I'm not regretful. I'm, I'm generating solar. I'm, in, I'm enjoying the, the system. Uh, I'm not going to wait for a 500 watt panel, although they're on the horizon. Yeah, I think there will be a lot of exciting things happening in battery technology. Mm -hmm. Right now, batteries, most people don't add batteries when they go solar. Um, they use net metering and they basically use the grid like their battery. When they have extra, they send it to the grid. When they need extra, they draw from the grid. Um, batteries really are only useful right now as something like a backup generator. They kick in when there's a power outage. Um, but there are ways that batteries, a battery sited at your home can actually serve the grid and earn you money. You know, if we were to kind of change how the, the, our grid operates a little bit, where, you know, you could be spitting out or drawing little bits of energy in and out of the battery to help maintain the right 
frequency levels of, of the power on, on the, the, the distribution grid. You now you could even through your inverter, which is already connected to the internet, um, your solar inverter, have that be dispatchable by the utility. So um, PPNL, the utility that serves a lot of Eastern PA, is trying an experiment where they're going to have some people's solar inverter be at least partly controlled by the utility to help manage uh, the grid broadly. And then, um, you know, if they figure out that this is useful and provides value to the utility, it could be something that you could get paid for. And you really, then we're, we're starting to move into the realm of what's called grid of the future, where it's not a few big power plants selling energy to the grid and we're just receiving it, um, but we're all, you know, playing a role in providing energy, using energy, storing energy. You know, there's ways that electric vehicles can be involved in this as well. So it's kind of this big picture moving from the electric utility is like a retailer. They're buying wholesale power and selling it to you to the electric utility is kind of like a traffic cop or a referee for the energy system. And there, there's energy coming from every direction from you to you and everybody's kind of sharing in this the, in production in, in the grid. There's a, I think in Massachusetts, they have some trust test programs going on in that now. And I, I forget the exact name for it, but I think the Tesla Powerwall has that traffic cop type uh, software built into it so that it can engage in these uh, utility trials. So that that is on the horizon. And like Henry said, that's something that'll be more or less transparent, except, you know, you would agree to it. If you have the equipment, it'll just work. You don't have to do any management of it. Wow. Doug, did you want to say something or no? I think oh, Stephanie had her hand up. Oh, Stephanie, I saw Doug's screen light up. Hi. Um, it's that electric power he's generating. Um, <laughs> I I uh, I was just interested, maybe Henry, in what are what are actually the steps to getting the 0.5 change to 5.5. You you mentioned this is a critical time. A number of us have already signed the um, the emails to our legislators, um, but what what. What happens, and where can we uh, where can we take action? Well, the um, you know it's just a matter it's a matter of passing this bill within the next two years. So our legislative session just started in January. It'll end in not this coming December, but December 2022. And so that's the time period we have to work with this bill. It's the the first thing it we should be doing is trying to help it earn a lot of co sponsors, other legislators who will tag their name onto the bill. And it's really important that it's that it's not all Democrats because a bill that looks like a Democratic bill is not gonna go very far in our legislature in Pennsylvania. Um, so, you know, talk to your own representatives, but, you know, talk to your friends and family in other parts of Pennsylvania too, to get them to, to rally their own, their own legislators to do this. Um, so, I mean, that, and then, you know, also generating some noise in the press, letting people know you know, people who care about solar but not, might not know what the AEPS is and why it matters, um, you know, explaining that to people, letters to the editor, to the local paper, paper talking about this issue. That's all stuff we can help with. We have templates and language and trainings and, and things like that. Okay, great. And I want to add to that, Henry, you mentioned the importance of um, solar power to diversify income for farmers. And here in Western Pennsylvania, we have a lot of agriculture. Um, the Pennsylvania Farmers Union has come out very strongly in, um, in support of solar energy as a way of providing income to farmers. And um, we were just on a, on a lobbying call with Mike Kelly's office in DC last week. And um, Michael Kobach, who owns Walnut Hill Farm in Mercer area, in Mercer County, um, he has grazing. He has a pasture, um, pasture based um, beef and sheep and chicken operation. And he talks about the, you know, the very great benefits to a farmer, not only for being able to make extra money in the event that you have a crop collapse or something happens that you, you aren't able to pay your bills that year, but also the solar panels can provide shade for dairy cows and animals. And they are very compatible with grazing under and around the solar panels if they're built to those specifications. So I think mentioning that, I think emphasizing that to our regional representatives and or to our regional senators about how this also has economic benefits as, um, as 
Henry pointed out, it spreads out those economic benefits, not just for the big power companies, but also for those people who are able to have community solar or who are able to um, put solar panels on their farms. Henry, did you want to say anything about the Triborough Cooperative that just opened up? Yeah, I mean, first I will just add on that note, um, there's an organization called the American Solar Grazing Association, which is worth looking into, and they're advocating for things like this. Um, what they're starting to do, so Susquehanna University built their own solar farm, they're buying the energy from it, and they have sheep grazing amongst the solar panels. And sheep, you know, seem to make the best yeah. buddy for solar panels because, you know, they're small enough to get easily fit underneath them. Um, they're good grazers. And then unlike goats, they're not going to jump up on top of the solar panel. They're not going to chew on the wiring in the back. Yeah, um, right. So you get this, right. these nice dual uses of the land. Um, and then, yeah, so the, the solar cup, thank you for reminding me that. So I, I, Bill mentioned this is how he went solar, but um, so a solar co-op, these are programs that we run all over the country. We take a geographic area, we educate a lot of people there about solar energy, and then we, we uh, basically help them earn a group rate from a competitively selected solar installer. So everybody goes through one company and that company can, can typically offer a better price than you might get going on your own. So we have one that's open to Allegheny and Westmoreland County residents. It's called the Triborough Solar Co-op. And I'll, once I finish talking, I can stick a link in the, uh, in the chat here, but it's free to join. It basically gives you access to whatever this group pricing deal ends up being, and then lots of technical support from us. And it doesn't obligate you to go solar if you join. So you can join, see what the price would end up being for you, maybe compare it with some other bids you get from someone else and then um, you know, decide if you want to go solar with the co-op. But it's a really tried and true tool we've helped you know, put up. We're well over 30 megawatts of solar now across the country through these solar co-ops. I'll, I'll find a link right now. So I think a, Monet posted a question about whether ground installation is much cheaper than rooftop. Oh, there it is. Yeah, um, it's not. It's the other way around. So uh, rooftop is, um, at least at, at the kind of home scale, rooftop is cheaper. Ground mount, you have to pour some concrete to you know, fix those, the, the posts into the ground. You have to dig trenching to carry the power line from the solar to the home, and that adds to the cost. There's some benefits with ground mount. Um, you don't have to worry about if your roof is facing the best direction or not. You don't have to worry about the condition of your roof. You, know, you can get those solar panels facing do south, get them angled just right. Um, and then solar panels, uh, they get less efficient as they heat up. So on a roof, there's not a lot of room for the air to circulate underneath the panel. They get hotter in the sun, but on the ground, there's lots of room for circulation. So they stay a little bit cooler and work a little bit more efficiently. So there's, there's some trade-offs there. Steve? Hi, yeah. In regard to in regard to the rooftop versus ground mounted, is maintenance much of an issue with rooftop? For instance, if you have a two story uh, building, and and how much maintenance is required when you're doing rooftop? So generally, solar is a low maintenance technology. There's no moving parts. It's very durable. Um, it does, of course, make maintenance issues easier if it's on the ground. So you know, if you may have, you know, one solar panel fail or you know one microinverter on the back of the solar panel fail and that's easier to diagnose and fix if it's on the ground and of course like bill was saying it's easier to wipe those panels clean of snow when they're on the ground although they also it, the snow does pretty easily melt off of them so um yeah that is that is one of the benefits of a ground mounted system yeah. henry can you speak to whether um you know the the contrast or the comparison between renting you know having a company put panels on your roof and renting versus owning? Yeah, so you can go solar by purchasing your panels outright and, and owning them. You know, maybe you finance it, you use a loan, or maybe you pay up front. Um, or you can go solar through a method called third-party ownership, um, where you get them put on your home for free. You don't own them. You probably also don't own the SRECs that come from them. And then you sign a long-term contract with the company who, who put them there to um, either 
If it's, if it's a power purchase agreement, you're buying every kilowatt hour that comes out of that solar. Or if it's a lease, you're paying a monthly lease payment. And the idea is, if it's a good deal, which it isn't necessarily always, but if it's a good deal, you're now lower electric bill because of the solar. Um, is uh, You're paying this now lower electric bill and you're paying this, this monthly fee for your solar. And that should be less than what you were paying before uh, for energy. So you're saving right away on net, you know, right from the beginning, you avoid this big upfront cost. So there's economic benefits to this, but with leased solar, um, you know, you don't get the tax credit. You don't get the SREX, the, the installers claiming those benefits and hopefully sharing them with you in the form of a low price. Um, and your net savings over the 25 to 30 year life of the system are probably or almost certainly going to be much lower than if you had owned the system yourself. They're also, you know, you're signing a long-term contract. There's a lot of fine print that catches people up. Sometimes the price you're paying will escalate after a few years and all of a sudden you're not saving money anymore. There's been some shady, pushy sales practices associated with solar leases and PPAs in the past. And it can make it more complicated to sell your home before that lease is up. Um, so it gets trickier. You know, if you hear a story about a bad customer experience with solar in the news, it's almost always they had a bad lease, a bad PPA that they didn't understand, or um, and they got stuck in it. Thanks. Other questions? I think we're actually just a little bit beyond three, and Henry, you probably need to get going. So um, I want to thank both Henry and Bill for being here and doing this presentation. And Henry and Bill, you don't mind if this recorded version is... Um, is uploaded for viewing on our Rachel Karsten Eco Village YouTube channel. Is that okay? Please. That's okay. With me, yeah. Yep. Yep. Henry, is that okay? Yeah. Great. Awesome. Great. All right. Thank you both very much. Um, Stephanie, if you have any words to say to wrap up. Uh, uh, just a, another thank you. It was excellent presentations from both of you, I think the combination was wonderful, um, and I appreciate Bill, your your tracking so carefully because um, that we know is what's uh, going to give us the real information. Um, we're intending to um, be monitoring our our buildings as well, so um, we'll, interesting to see your experience with that. Um, so this has uh, been great to get us thinking and inspired about how we're going to contribute in some way to um, a better better world through what we're doing. Um, and uh, I just want to thank everybody for participating. We won't do a closing round um, this time, but um, I will just remind everyone that uh, the Richland Township uh, Board of Supervisors hearing is on April 7th at 8 p.m. Um, they have a few uh, uh, in-person seats, uh, so those are all socially distanced, but um, certainly if you'd like to be there, I will, I will be there myself. Um, otherwise, you can attend virtually. Um, so um, our next meeting, April 24th, thanks to everybody who participated today and uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move ahead. So um, see you again uh, at either at, out of the site tomorrow or at one of our uh, upcoming, uh, our happy hour or one of our planning group meetings. So thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye -bye. Thanks Henry, thanks Bill. Thanks Welcome. everybody. Hope to see you, you tomorrow. Bye.